We're very, very fortunate to have the Hardy Fruits Project Manager from the Carrington Research Extension Center, Kathy Wiederholt. And Kathy's going to tell us about all the fascinating research she does on so many different types of fruits. So let's welcome Kathy to the forum. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Tom kind of stole my April Fool's joke. I was going to say, guess what? It's spring. Oh, April Fool's. <laughs> On Sunday evening before the storm, I, I went out and I looked at the orchard and the only snow was in between the grapes. It was kind of a mound right in the middle of the trellis. And now, well, it's all over and the, and the snow's about twice as deep. So we got about 10 inches in Carrington, so a little more than the in Fargo area here. So uh, there's some nice drifts. There's some nice drifts. Well, as Tom said, I'm the fruit project manager at Carrington. And we'll talk about the, our cold climate fruits there. They're kind of neat, I think. Uh, some you may know about, some you may not know about. And, uh, well, let's just get started here. Um, I, which way do I go here? Where's my computer? There? There. Hey, it's not moving. And it did just when I practiced. Here, how about this? It is not moving, guys. <laughs> well, we'll do a little background in the meantime. Um, you know, I don't have a horticulture background. I'm actually a food microbiologist. I studied bacteriology. Ah, okay. What do I need to do here? Okay, it was just sleeping. And anyway, um, but I moved to North Dakota here, and I've been doing microbiology and genetics for a long time, and then I've always had an interest in horticulture. Um, I, I studied the books on plant ID when I was a kid. And uh, I knew the, I knew, I know a lot of the um, scientific names of plants. And I took classes when I was in college just on my own, botany and zoology and horticulture. I took a horticulture in my, in my fifth year of college. And I didn't even know about horticulture. And now I do. And, you know, I thought about changing my major, but I thought, no way, no way. I've already been in school so long. And then I went on to grad school in bacteriology. So, I just had the opportunity when I came here to Carrington, and I have really loved every minute of it. And uh, you shouldn't tell the research center, but I would do it even if I wasn't paid. And, and that's saying something. It's really fun. So let's look at the slides here. Um, this is this is kind of the soil types of North Dakota, and Carrington is in this drift prairie region. It's this big brown area that takes up a lot of North Dakota. Really nice soils. You in in in, in general, really nice soils and. So a lot of our research is going to apply to a lot of places in North Dakota, and uh, certainly the weather conditions across the state. So this is a little overview of our orchard. It's six acres in total, but we share it with Woody Plant Research. Dr. Dr. Todd West is out there, and prior to that, it was Dr. Herman doing all of their Woody Plant Research. And we've got just a lot of cool stuff out there. So uh, we have a deer fence. That was kind of the square line around there. We have a deer fence to keep them out, and that really helps. Uh, we have a lot of them. So this is our research project. We don't just have it for the fun of it. We actually have research goals, you know. Um, in the beginning, we just wanted to identify different plants that would grow out there. We started with apples, plums, grapes, and June berries. Those were kind of selected before I even started. I have to say, the project was uh, the brainchild of our of our director, Blaine Schatz. He really is interested in fruit, and he could just tell from going to meetings around the state, going to the very first wine and grapes meeting at Carrington, that people wanted to know more about fruits than, than they were getting information for. And um, so he said, we should, we should do this here at Carrington. And then um, so he ordered some of the first plants, and they hired me, and we got started on it. And I kind of ran with it. <laughs> I, um, you know, we planted that first stuff, and then that winter, and I have to say how poor we were, or at least for my project, because we're just funded internally. Um, I worked from my own home that winter. I just went over the internet and looked for stuff. I wanted to find things that were helpful, that were hardy, of course, in North Dakota, that grew really easily. We wouldn't have to spray them a lot, you know. Um, so there were a lot of things around the country and around the world that we aren't growing here in North Dakota that we could be growing. Um, and so we will talk about these things tonight. Um, we take notes at all these plants we, in the spring, uh, just see if anything has winter damage, and then throughout the year if it has any kind of diseases, and then we harvest all the fruit, uh, pick it, we weigh it, we weigh individual berries to check out that size, and 
Um, and then as fall goes along, late, late summer, start measuring, and we look for vigor, which is, and we include like height and width and any diseases and insects bothering the plants. So we do take a lot of notes on the plants, and it pretty much takes me till around January sometime to get all those notes entered in the computer and writing reports and stuff. So uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of info there. So the other part of our our project is to deliver information to the public and. I have to say, I'm pretty impressed when I look at the numbers. Uh, we didn't really start doing uh, talks like this or presentations until about 2010. Um, we started in 2006, and then 2007 we planted a lot of the other plants, and then about 2010 is when we started doing presentations and having field days. And since then, I believe my numbers are around 3,100 people that I've had contact with in the state, a little bit out of state, but mainly in the state. So we're pretty proud of that. We're pretty proud of all the work we've done with that. Uh, this is a list of all the fruits that we have. Um, we have 14 different kinds of fruits. And when I say 14, we have, tree, we have cherry shrubs and cherry trees. So I count that as two. Uh, they do ripen a little differently. And then we also have like half gaps and honeyberries. Kind of the same, actually different species. Um, and their terms are kind of used interchangeably depending on who you talk to. So uh, well, let's get let's get into these really cool fruits that we have here. I've kind of condensed this down. We have 20 minutes, and then we're going to take questions. So if you've heard me talk before, or you just have questions about uh, any kind of disease or production issues that I don't talk about, just just ask that. So I'll be really happy to answer that. Um, the first fruit we have here are pictures of black, red, and white currants. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the red and white currants. You know, they're really popular in other countries. They're tart. If you like a tart fruit, you will like these. Um, people eat them as just a, like a snack in the northern countries of like Norway or Sweden, maybe in Russia, things like that. They're really kind of a snack for people. They'll be on at somebody's table when you visit them at their house. Um, but we don't, I don't know if we like those so much here in America. They're really too tart for me. They really kind of make my teeth hurt a little bit. But they make fabulous jelly, and they make really fabulous wine. You know, I had some berries for two years, and I didn't know what to do with them. And I gave them to our local winemaker, and I said, just try these, all right? And then he brought me a bottle at Christmas, and I took it home to my family, and I tried it. Oh, my gosh. It's red. It's delicious. It's really juicy. I really can't speak highly enough of it. It was really delicious. I've actually had a second winemaker make wine from the currants, and his wine is just as good. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this, to seeing more red currant wine. Uh, and then our third, our third currant is black currants. Um, they're the most economically important across the world. Um, you know, like I said, we don't really know about them here in the U.S., but Back in like the early 1900s, we had about 10,000 acres, and I, I just, I, I've said this before, and I still haven't looked it up. I remember 10,000 acres, and I don't know if that was from New York State or if that was from the U.S., but there were 10,000 acres of black currants somewhere in the U.S. in the early 1900s, and they were all removed by an eradication program. Um, there were, there's a disease called white pine blister rust. And it came in from, actually it's from Asia, it migrated to Europe, and then um, we actually brought in white pine seedlings to the U.S. And we had to replant all those timber trees in the east. You know, we didn't have nurseries here in the U.S., so we brought in little trees from Germany. And those trees had white pine blister rust on them. And so then it spread, and it has to travel between the black currants and the white pines. And... Um, you know, we get it here in Carrington, and we have, I would say, zero white pine trees in our area. But, um, you know, it travels on the wind. It can come into the currents from 350 miles away, so kind of kind of crazy. But it only travels a few, a few hundred feet to the pine trees. So um, you can plant resistant varieties. There are several, or more than several, resistant varieties of currents that are resistant to this disease. And then it won't spread to the white pine trees. So um, I think they're really something you should try to grow. They, they're kind of funky in that the leaves and the branches have like a, a cat pee smell to them. Uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> here everybody's looking at me. Um, but that's just the leaves and the branches. It's not the berries. The berries taste like pine. They taste like a piece of two by four. 
But that shouldn't, <laughs> that shouldn't slow you down either because actually that's kind of a fresh flavor. And when you make a jelly out of them, if you make a wine, a liqueur, um, anything, that flavor is gone and they are just so rich and so juicy. And I'm telling you, you have to try to believe them. Um, raw, you know what? I love them raw, but it is something you would have to get used to, I really think, because it, it's sweet, it's tart, and it's piney. And it's not cat PE, that's just a bonus on the plants. But um, the berries themselves are very delicious, and just thinking about them, I'm, I'm wanting some. So, you know, they're, they're pretty cool, and they're really high in nutrients. They are really, really high. So, but let's go on here, because I'm running out of time with all my chattering about my plants. Um, half caps and honeyberries. We have these at the research center. They are native to northern areas around the world. They're native in Canada. They're native in Russia. They are native in Japan. So um, they're also very helpful. They have extra skin. Like there's actually two berries together with a third skin that covers them. And a lot of these nutrients are right in the skin. So that's really cool. They are zone two hardy. So flowers when they're blooming early in the spring can withstand about 19 degrees Fahrenheit, so if it gets kind of cold, they'll be all right. And then, um, what else? Uh, they're juicy. They're, they're delicious. They're really, really good, and they, our soil is just fine for them. They can take clay. They can take pH 8, so no problem. I would definitely try to grow these in North Dakota. Um, a little hard to find, I would call your greenhouse and your local greenhouse or nursery and ask about them because I'm sure a lot of them have been hearing about them from me, probably. Um, so I hope they are. So ask about them. But if not, there's information. I also have some sources on the handouts that I have. There's a source for these honey berries. So the one thing about them that is a, a slight problem is you have to net them. The birds think these are the best things ever, and you will have to net them or you won't get a crop. That little bird in that picture was only about eight feet away from me, and he didn't care. He really wanted those berries. So. Uh, we have these cherries. We have the Canadian hardy shrub cherries or dwarf hardy cherries. They're just a shrub. They're not a tree. They get about um, seven feet tall, maybe five feet wide, something like that. And you can prune, you know, to improve the size in that and maybe make it more open if you need to. Um, but this last year was, we planted in 2007 and it was the 2013 season. Um, when I planted them, they were just little sticks. And this year we had 30 pounds, on average, 30 pounds of fruit per plant on the Carmine Jewels. So they're, they're, they're just loaded and they're wonderful. Um, there's several kinds available here in the U.S., but in Canada there's like six kinds. So we're, we're hoping to get more here in the U.S. That would be really nice. Um, they're red all the way through, so they're a little more helpful than a typical cherry. And these are, these are tart cherries or pie cherries, but actually they have a lot of sugar. They can be actually sweeter than a, than a sweet cherry. It's just that they have more acid, so they're high in vitamin C, and um, they will always be kind of tart, but some of these are very, very good and nice for fresh eating. So that's the cherries. Um, Juneberries. We have five varieties of Juneberries. We have 100 plants total. Uh, the varieties we have are from Canada. We have uh, Smoky, uh, honey, Smoky and Honeywood. Those are kind of older, I call them, a little more um, vegetal, a little more chewy when you eat them. And then we have these big juicy varieties. We have Pacin, we have Martin, and we have JD30. And they are really nice. They, they really are juicy. They're like a large blueberry. They're, I mean, you can see the picture there. Um, they're very nice. And, and one thing with Juneberries, I think I included this as only a slide here, um, because they are native to North Dakota, they have native diseases. They're in the family, uh, they're in those ACA, along with apples, and they can get a lot of diseases. Um, it, it, I don't know if this is true or not, but in Canada, I've been told you cannot grow them organically. You know, they get cedar apple rust pretty readily, uh, but we have not had much of a problem. You can see in this picture, um, let's see if this works here. I have to do it here, but will it work on here? Oh, I can use my pointer perhaps. Yeah, here's this picture with the netting, and there's a little orange spot. That is cedar apple rust. And then there's a little yellow leaf. That is probably Enthymosporium leaf and berry spot. It's another fungal disease that gets on the plants. And then um, those pictures, the picture of the flower down below.
Those little brown spots on the flowers are from thrips. Little flower thrips, they chew on the flowers. Um, so there's a lot of things going on with these plants. So, you know, we may, you may need to apply some um, pesticides early on, but um, I've been able to control this in an organic matter with organic pesticides, so I feel pretty good about that. And if you need more information, I would actually say just to email me or call me later because, you know, there's a lot of stuff to talk about in there. But, you know, as far as growing these is, is for a you pick or something, I think Jimberry is maybe the way to go because there are a few around the state and they, they sell out every year and that they command very nice prices for these. So I really think uh, a, a Jimberry orchard might be some very nice, um, nice plant to have as a you pick. And then add some of these other fruits in too because, you know, if people try them, I think they're really going to like them. We may not know about these fruits, but if you try them, you're going to like them and, um, you might be surprised. So, aronia. Here is our aronias. And, you know, I, I think aronia is a bit of a conundrum because it produces like crazy. But the fruit doesn't really taste that good. It's just kind of, it's kind of vegetal. It's really um, tannic. It has a lot of tannins, which means that when you eat them, they're really going to dry your mouth out. And I have, you know, I can't waste the berry. And when the bird, when I'm picking the fruit, and the birds have maybe, tried one. They just try one. They break the skin. I'll eat them. And I've eaten maybe a dozen of these things. And then I have to go for a drink of water because they are stuck in my throat. They, they really dry out your tissues that much. But, you know, they, they say you should freeze them before using them and cooking also helps. I've read that putting them with a, a dairy product, like if you put, uh, put them with yogurt or ice cream or something like that, that will help remove that tannin because the casing binds to the tannin. Um, the casein is the protein in the milk, but that binds to the tannin. Um, but definitely freezing them. I made some banana bread with them frozen, and I thought, well, this isn't going to work out. But it was wonderful. I actually would serve it to you. It was very, very good. So, um, you know, they're growing aronia like crazy. There are some big plantings, like even 10 acres in Nebraska and Iowa. There's some in Wisconsin, probably some in Minnesota. There are... I don't know, between three and five plantings of maybe a couple thousand here in North Dakota. So people are interested in them. I mean, like I said, they produce like crazy, and you can generally grow them organically. And that is what the market wants, too, is the organic aronia. So, um, yeah, they're pretty interesting little guys. All right, here's our apples and plums, the side of our apples and plums. We have five kinds of apples and five kinds of plums. Our plums, you know, yeah, we've had just really spotty production on them. And we had, we had pretty good production this last year, but then we got the plum curculios, and they bit them, and then they start, you know, they'll start to turn red. Well, I pick those all off, and I throw them away in the garbage, um, try to reduce that. And I haven't sprayed for them, so some years you get more problems than others. They say chickens. Chickens will eat those little bugs. So shake them off the tree, and the chickens will eat them. So I don't have any chickens, but they will pay them a few crows. I don't know. <laughs> um, we do, we have, we, I said we have five kinds of apples, and the starred ones are Hazen, Honeycrisp, and Death Star. And those have been really wonderful for us. I've been kind of down on Hazen in the past because it gets kind of mushy and soft. Like, if you pick it and let it sit on your desk for two days, it's brown inside. It's mushy. It's terrible. But if you, you know, you watch how ripe they are on the tree and you pick them just at a nice time, uh, and then you get them right into the refrigerator, well, I still last at least one month in good quality, and then they'll start to go down. But they're just a good, you know, I'm going to say they're a good average apple. They will bear pretty much every year. They make a nice pie. I've made crisp with them. They're good to eat. They're not spectacular, but they are a good apple that produces every year. So, and then honey crisp, we have had such good luck. We had about 400 pounds on the six trees we had this year, and I really thin them. First we prune. And then uh, when they are just like little vines, we pick off all but one fruit from the cluster. And then about a week later, maybe two weeks, no, about two weeks, but a week or so later when they've gotten to like an inch, when you can really see them. And I've gone back through and picked off some of those, really to reduce the number on the tree. And still there was a lot of apples when we did that. I think we should maybe reduce to maybe six inches per apple next year or four inches, something like that, just to make sure. But... Um, you know, by doing that, you can maybe get your apples to produce every year instead of every other year. It's possible for some varieties, not possible for others. So, and then the last one I really recommend is Death Star. It's an early apple. It is 
juicy, it's crispy, it's tender, it's really good, like a Macintosh on steroids. If you've had a good Macintosh, a really good one. So these Zest are really delicious. So that may be the end of my talk. Oh, there's a picture. There's an ideally pruned apple tree in your home orchard. Um, really clean out the inside of your tree. Tom actually came and helped me this year. <laughs> we didn't kill anything. <laughs> he told me to take down the height of these standard trees. And I said, you'll come and like hold my hand because hold my pruners because <laughs> I just wanted to see how much I could really how much damage I could really do to them. We can do a lot, and then they look great. So yeah, open up your tree and really uh, get them out there. So it'll be good. And that tree was partly picked already when I took the picture. Don't think there's not any fruit on there. <laughs> so all right, the end of my presentation. 20 minutes and 41 seconds here. This is good. Uh, here's a picture. I have my little timer. Um, this is a picture from the fall of our of our orchard. It is very beautiful. And those beautiful yellow leaves on the juniperberry, that's the end of the thorium leaf and berry spot, showing its ugly head in the fall. So, all right. Uh, if there's any questions, okay, I'll take Kathy, them. Thank you. Um, we got some got. questions already. First of all, about juniperberries. Person's heard you shouldn't grow June berries if you got cedars or junipers nearby. Does that make sense to you? It, should we shouldn't grow. Should I repeat this or no? We're fine. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, you will see. I believe you will see the rust if you have uh, junipers nearby. I don't know if the cedars are really part of it, but for sure the junipers are. I only thought it was cedar apple rust, and I recently read that it's actually the junipers that do it. So. Perhaps a red cedar. It's really a juniper, I know. So that might be it. But I, I, you probably should be cautious. Um, you're probably going to see it. Right. Okay. How about aronia, aka chokeberry? Does it have seeds or pits? Aronia does have seeds. They're little apples. Aronia is, if you look at it, it's a little apple, like a delicious apple. It's got a big shoulder, and then it's got kind of small bottom, and it's got that. Apple scar at the bottom, that blossom scar that you can totally recognize as a as an apple, you know, or in the Rosaceae family. So, yeah, they have little seeds, just like an apple. Now, are there varieties of aronia that are non-edible? Are there varieties? I uh -oh. believe there are. There are some red ones, but I think the red may even be edible. But I think there are some that are not edible. The ones we're growing for for fruit for eating like this. They're actually a cross between mountain ash and aronia melanocarpa, which is from the U.S. And they just found this out in the last year. They did genetic testing. So the wild aronia is here in, the, in the North America. I believe they're still edible, but they're going to be smaller and, and not as nice as these, um, these ones that are bred more for the fruit production. Yeah, you know, why would you want a non-edible type? Um, why not just let the birds eat them when they're starving yeah. in January? I think they're not not edible to the birds. They may just be too panic and horrible to us. Yeah, they'll eat them when they're hungry enough. <laughs> <clears throat> like now. Okay, here's another question on apples. Uh, can a Zestar pollinate a honey crisp? I'll say yes if they bloom at the same time. I have to say I'm not really sure, but if you live in town and there's crab apples anywhere in the neighborhood, a crab apple will pollinate your apples. It's the best pollinator, um, best pollinizer that there is. But um, you just have to see if they if they bloom at the same time. Uh, do you have any recommendations on gooseberry cultivars? All right, I did talk about them, but we have some. I would recommend Hamaki Red. That has been it's the most flavorful and it's been the most disease resistant for us. So it's a very good, very good variety. Okay, how about elderberries? What varieties are you considering, and which ones did not work? Ah, our elderberries. You know what? The name varieties didn't work. The, the Johns, the York, the Adams, and the Nova. They are the name varieties that are said to be the hardiest. Um, none of them have ripened in Carrington. They kind of will get a red black at the most. Um, but they just won't ripen fully. I have heard from people across the state that the ones they've gotten from soil conservation ripen just fine here in North Dakota. So I've asked people to send me little root, roots of the, you know, you can dig down in the soil where a stem goes in and you'll see like part of the root. 
If you could say, if you've got one that grows really well, produces a lot of berries, I would like to hear from you, and I would like a piece of that plant. All we need is like five inches of root and maybe a little bit of stem so leaves can start growing, and that's all it takes to start an elderberry. So. Okay, good. Here, how about raspberries? This person last year, Kathy, when picking the raspberries, noticed what looked like a white worm in the fruit. Oh, but the person already ate some. Oh, but evidently they survived. Any comments on it? For you, because you're like a world citizen eating insects. Those little worms are the spotted wings of Sophila, and I'm glad you asked this because I did want to bring it up. Um, it's a new fruit fly here in the United States for about the last five, seven years, and it has just showed up in North Dakota. It was actually, I wasn't uh, confirmed, but it was in North Dakota in 2012. I had a little damage on our cherry plants. And then in 2013, we had a lot of damage, and I sent in fruit, and I sent in a fly that I caught. And uh, it was identified here at the, at the lab, and it was spotted Drosophila. This rotten little fruit fly, um, it lays its eggs in fruit that is just starting to ripen. It's going to, it's the color is starting to change to its ripe color, and then it lays its eggs in there. So by the time it's actually ripe, the fruit is spoiled, or the worm is growing in there. So especially in raspberries, they love raspberries, and a group from the, horticul the, the horticulture group is putting together a fact sheet for North Dakota, and it will list pesticides that you can use in, in North Dakota in your home garden. And I hate to say this, but it's true, because I, I hate to think about it, not say it, but I hate to think about it, but to control these fruit flies, anywhere fruit is grown where the fruit fly is, that fruit will need to be sprayed every seven days, every seven days. With a, with a pesticide. And a lot of them are, are pyrethroid uh, products. Organically, you can use something called Entrust, which is a spinosin, and then you can use, um, which is things Monterey Bay or Monterey Garden, something, uh, I can't remember the whole name of it, but it has to be a spinosin. And then you can also use Pyganic, which is, a py which is the organic pyrethrin form. That Pyganic is only good for like two days because it breaks down in sunlight, it just doesn't have any residual. So organically, you are really challenged to, to keep these berries free from insects. So know that any place this fruit is grown where there are fruit flies, your fruit is being sprayed on a regular basis because there's, you would not get a crop without that. So it's just something to think about. It's the raspberries and cherries, for sure we know they love them here in North Dakota, but they love many things. Is there a way to to monitor for them or to trap them to see if they've found your planting? There is a, there is a way to monitor. And what, uh, what people are kind of using are like the one-quart clear deli containers. And you poke a few holes. Oops, sorry, there's my camera. Uh, you poke a few holes around it. And we can find this online. And uh, I think this is cited in the fact sheet that's coming out. We poke a few holes in it. And you can even use apple cider vinegar. I got the best trapping when I dropped a few cherries into my apple cider vinegar. Um, this is, of course, after the fact. Um, and then there's another way they say it's the best is to use water, sugar, and yeast, and that will really attract these, these female fruit flies. And you put a little sticky card in there. You can buy them on Amazon. That's where I got mine. And the other plant, little garden, um, your garden catalogs will have these little yellow sticky traps. And you can see if the fruit fly sticks to them, or you can just have the liquid, and they'll fly down in the liquid, and then put a drop of soap in there to break the tension. And they say every week you should, at least once a week, but perhaps more, you should pour this out into a strainer or look at your sticky card and see if there are fruit flies on there. And the time you ask is when you find one fruit fly. Because, you know, I guess they're like termites. You find one and then there's a hundred million. So you start spraying when you find one fruit fly. So this is pretty depressing. You should have heard our heart call when we confirmed this here. We were all pretty down in the dumps. Yeah. <coughs> Kathy was weeping openly. That was very sad. <coughs> Fly with many things organically here in North Dakota because our great winters and, you know, not many people are growing fruit, so there's not a lot of pest pressure, so. Kathy, let's, let's be more optimistic, change the topic here. How about, uh, we got a budget conscious 
Gardner here. Do you need more than one half-cap plant for production, or is one good enough? Half-caps, you do need. You do need more than one. You'll need at least two. Um, and you'll want more than two because they taste so good. They really do. Um, but yeah, they're kind of like apple trees. You need two different varieties to, poll to pollinize each other. And whoever you buy it from should be able to sell you the correct pollinizer. Do you, the, do you have tours of your fruit research center at Carrington? And if so, when? Of course we have tours. Uh, our big tour is the field day in July. It's the second, I believe the second Tuesday in July. It's the 15th this year. Make sure that's right on the calendars, but it's a Tuesday. Um, um, this year, very exciting. I haven't actually announced this in a press release, but so you are the first one to know. Dr. Bob Boyd is coming to our field day. He is the plant breeder from University of, Sus of Saskatchewan, Saskatoon. And he's super famous. He helped release those cherries, those Hardy's cherries, and the Haskaps. Um, there's over 2 million Haskaps now planted up in Canada. Um, probably a couple million pounds of cherries being harvested every year. Uh, like three fruit organizations have started because of his work. He's really influential. He's the northernmost and really only breeder of cold hardy fruits in North America. So he's doing a lot of good work. So pretty exciting. You should come see him. Okay, we will. How about, uh, Kathy, you talk, keep talking about organic pesticides, but we don't know where to get them. You know what? Uh, the best source I can tell you, and I, should, I, should, I guess I should say not an endorsement, but it's where I look for them, is Johnny Select Seeds or Johnny Seeds. They've got a table in there. It can tell you the pest. It can tell you the pest size they like best, and they try to go with low toxicity or organic products. So that would be a place to start. It would be a really good place to start. Johnny Seeds. How about blueberries? Do you have any recommendations on growing blueberries? I do. I do. You should move to Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our weather is fine for blueberries, but they hate our soil. Right? Blueberries like a pH, a soil pH of four and a half to five. Our soil pH is eight, seven and a half to eight. No matter what you do, that plant will always be sad because its needs are not being satisfied. And I mean, you can try to change the pH, but every spring when the water table comes up and stuff, the water starts moving horizontally, it's going to bring high pH water into your blueberries. The only thing you could do is a, is a, is a container or a raised bed, and then when you water, you would acidify your water a little bit, and you would have special medium there in that bed, you know, something with peat moss and maybe sand. I'm not sure on the whole formulation, but they do grow in sandy soils in northern Wisconsin. So, and they love acid, acidity, so peat moss. So. Right, forget blueberries. Don't exactly. Don't even think about it. In place. How about plum cultivars? Do you have a couple favorite plum mm, cultivars? Plums. You know, um, I think, I can't remember. I think Pipestone. Wait, let me go backwards. It's probably sleeping, but. Oh, Pembina. Pembina was one we've had a couple trees that have just been loaded and they've been very nice. The Pembina, Pipestone, and Juanita are very good tasting plums. Uh, the toka is the best tasting one, but ours is just like three quarters of an inch to an inch. It's really tiny. Um, but again, we, we just have really spotty production. Um, if I was to plant a new plum tree, I might try the new one from uh, Dr. Brian Smith in, in River Falls, Wisconsin, and that is the black ice plum. I've heard good things about it, but I haven't grown it myself. The, worth a try, I think. You no, know, you need two cultivars to make it work. Best colonizer may be a wild plum. Is a Saskatoon berry the same as a June berry? Yes, Saskatoons and June berries. Same thing. Sorry. Okay, we'll keep talking now. <laughs> you know, I know region, so cultivar region is available uh, from catalogs, but that is yeah, kind of marginal, and I don't think you'll be very happy with it as compared to uh, some of these Canadian varieties. Okay, Kathy. How about... Which apple tree was the one you pruned hard to get it to produce every year? Which apple tree? Well, all of them. But um, Hazen just does produce every year. We prune it nicely. Um, I would say I don't prune hard like a, like a real orchard does. I normally really cut the tips of their branches back and stuff. I don't do that. But um, just try to prune for openness. My, my best advice 
is go for upward and outward. So something like this. <laughs> it's upward and outward. You want to get rid of all kinds of low stuff, but um, all apples will just be, apple trees will be happier if you prune. I just wrote something about this, but you know, if you, you print out a lot of the extra growth, you're also reducing the crop load when you do that, and you're letting in more light. The apples you get will be bigger, and they'll be fewer, so hopefully uh, your tree will ripen them a little faster, and then it, when you pick them and relieve that crop from the tree, your tree will just be a little more ready when winter really comes. It'll have a little more energy to, to try to produce a good crop the next year. So. Okay, we're going to have some rapid-fire questions here. All right. Uh, will a snow crab work as a pollinator for an apple? Yes. It blooms at the same time. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite Juneberry variety for North Dakota? Give us a couple. Oh, the three that we have that are really like are Thiessen, which spells like Thiessen, but it's Thiessen, like Thomas, Thiessen, Martin, JB30. And I've heard good things about Lee 8 or Northline. Kathy, how come you're talking about blackberries tonight? What's going on? Blackberries. Do you have a high tunnel? Because if you have a high tunnel, you can probably get them to ripen. I, they're not, I'm not totally sure, but when you see them in catalogs, they say zone 5, zone 6. They are not really hardy here in, in our parts of North Dakota, um, and they take a long time to ripen. So, you know, I think, I think if you've had a high tunnel, you might even try the primocane varieties. There's Prime Jim and Prime Jan, and I think one more. But I would actually try those, or a thornless variety, if you had a high tunnel. A little extra growing degree days. You've got three honeycrisp trees. Will they pollinate each other? No, not very well. I mean, you might get a little production, but um, you need something else in the area. It, if someone's got a crab apple tree, that'll do it. So. Right. Okay, how about, oh, when I was a kid, we used to have wild growing. We called them blackberries but they had the consistency of June berries. They grew on the edge of the garden on small bushes. Do you know what they were? No. Oh, <laughs> so, I mean, bushes, did they have, right back, did they have, berries, right? Black did they have thorns? Right Matt, back, did they, they have thorns? thorns on them? How about a black raspberry? Am I, it could be a black raspberry. In Wisconsin, they grew wild. And I do have some here that I've planted, a variety called Jewel. Um, I'd say they'll kill you when you sleep because uh, the new canes, they'll grow like this high, and then they'll touch the ground way over there. So you need to look out for them. This person says blackberries will grow in the wild of North Dakota. Go for it. They grew in the wild in Wisconsin, too, but we never were able to grow them, the, the cane varieties in our garden. So. Maybe they should take some some cuttings of that yeah. and send them to Kathy at Carrington. <laughs> I don't want me. We'll name, we'll name the variety. I need mean, non thorny things. <laughs> okay, here we'll just do one uh, more question. Uh, how about apricots or pears? Any good varieties? Any yeah. You know, I, I'm not familiar with the apricots, and people do ask me about them, and I think if you're a little farther south, maybe they might do a little better. Um, you know, they say you might get a crop once every five years, so we don't have them. Um, you know, people are working. There's the Northern Fruit Explorers, North, North American Fruit Explorers, NAFAC. They're very interesting, and they have an apricot group that's active, and they're trying to put the apricots on hardier quince roots to try to get them to bloom a little later and maybe be hardier. So they're working on that. And what was the other one? Oh, pears. You know what? I'm interested in pears, and... I keep thinking I'm going to get some, but I haven't. I, I've heard the varieties that do well are the Summer Crisp and is it Luscious. Yeah, there's, is it Parker? The Yuri uh, Golden Spice, right. Those Golden Spice, Summer Crisp, Yuri, they're the ones for sure that do better here in North Dakota. Um, I would say maybe worth a try from um, St. Lawrence Nursery. To, they have some, they say, are extra hardy. And they claim they're zone four, but that's a different zone four than North Dakota. So <laughs> they don't have the wind. That's right. Okay, we want to thank every, thank you, Kathy, for your presentation. I know we didn't get to all everybody's questions, but we will have an overtime session at 8.30, and we'll do our best to get to your questions at that time. So we're going to take a five-minute break, everybody, and then we're going to start learning about Diseases, okay, later. <laughs>